All right. Um, are there any questions about uh, administrative matters or anything like that, about the um, assignments? I sent out an email about that, which I hope was clear. Okay. Okay, so um, just first of all, as a summary of the kind of the moral from last time, before I start talk about the new stuff, um, is that according to Carnap, what's important about science is its um, responsible attitude, halto. So, I mean, that's, I guess, supposed to be important both in explaining science, right? Like, why is it so successful? Um, but also is what's important about science from the point of view of philosophers who might want to um, learn from science. Um, and this responsible attitude is... Uh, so to speak, manifested in science's use of legitimate concepts. Right? Remember, this is something I said at the beginning of the course about the difference between Carnap and Popper, but that Carnap is going to say that the distinctive rationality of modern science consists, oops, you can't see that, can you? Right, sorry. So, uh, according to Carnap, what distinguishes modern science as peculiarly rational is its use of legitimate concepts. And, um, and what that means is that... Um, What that means is that it uses uh, concepts such that all of its statements, it's possible in principle to specify what counts as evidence for or against them. Um, and um, You can tell this about science by studying the language of science and showing, and this is what philosophy of science is going to do, showing that the language of science can be translated into a new language that makes this responsibility clear. Um, right, A new language in which it's obvious which concepts are legitimate because you can eliminate them by reducing them to the basic relation. Um, um, and because we have to language is conventional, we have to choose whether to use a language that can be translated that way or not. Or I guess you might also say we have to choose whether to accept such a translation of our language or not. I think those are two ways of putting the same thing. Um, therefore, this attitude is a practical and ultimately an, an ethical attitude, right? It's like, it's a matter of whether our will is in the right place. Our will to speak clearly and... Um, otherwise remain silent. <laughs> okay, so that was kind of the, the moral last time about what Carnap is after in the Aufbau. Um, so the new material, um, this book, The Unity of Science, So I, this is actually kind of weird as a book. Um, uh, 
Um, it wasn't actually written by Carnap as a book, but it's a translation of a long German article that Carnap published. The title of the German article is Die Physikalische Sprache als Universal Sprache der Wissenschaft, The Physical Language as Universal Language of Science. That was the original title. Um, uh, but someone decided to translate it into English and publish it as a small book and give it the title Unity of Science. Um, this was as part of the process of moving this school of logical positivism from German-speaking countries to English-speaking countries, um, which became necessary in the early 30s I mean, well, it became necessary both because people in English-speaking language countries were really interested in this new school, but also because um, these people were not popular with the Nazis. So um, they were mostly uh, socialists or Marxists like Neurath and... Um, Uh, some of them were Jewish, not Karnap, but some of the others. So, um, okay, that's a problem. Now my new light is reflecting off the screen. What can I do? This way. This way. Okay, whatever. Um, all right, so that's what this book is. It's a translation of this of this German article called "The Physical Language as Universal Language of Science." Um, what is new in this at this stage compared to the Aufbau? It's only a few years afterwards. I think the Aufbau was published in twenty nine, and this was published in thirty two. If I don't have those dates wrong. Um, okay, so what what has changed in here? Well. Um, First of all, I guess there's, I mean, this is something which I argued is already true in the Aufbau, but it's not so clear that, um, philosophy is about language. That is, um, philosophical theory is about language. Um, so, uh, um, the way Carnap expresses that at this stage in the unity of science is by this distinction between the formal mode and the material mode. And he says that, um, um, correct philosophy, I guess I should say, right, as opposed to metaphysics, is distinguished by the fact that although it sometimes speaks in the material mode, everything it says can be translated into the formal mode. Okay, so what is, what's the formal mode and the material mode? I'm going to try, um, see how this works out to just share my, uh, just share my uh, Acrobat window here. So, um, right, so this is where he introduces the distinction between uh, the formal mode and the material mode. In formulating the thesis of the unity of science as the assertion that objects are of a single kind. So remember, that is the way he pretty much formulated this assertion in the Aufbau, at least to begin with. That was the way he stated it. There's only one object realm and only one science. So in formulating the thesis of the unity of science as the assertion that objects are of a single kind, that states of affairs are of a single kind, we are using the ordinary fashion of speech in terms of objects and states of affairs. The correct formulation 
Now, of course, by correct formulation, he doesn't mean in everyday life we shouldn't talk about things and states of affairs, but he means the correct formulation if you're doing philosophy. I, um, the correct formulation replaces objects by words and states of affairs by statements. For a philosophical, that is, uh, sorry, for a philosophical, that is, a logical investigation must be an analysis of language. Since the terminology of the analysis of language is unfamiliar, we propose to use the more usual mode of speech, which we will call material, side by side with the correct manner of speaking, which we will call formal. Right? So the um, material mode talks about um, sciences and their objects, what they're about, and says things like, it might seem like there's two different sciences with two different types of object, but in fact, um, there are uh, uh, there's one object domain and therefore only one science. That's the material mode. The formal mode is going to switch that to talking about the language of science. And it's going to say, instead, it might seem like there are many different languages used by scientists, that each one contains its own words that aren't found in the others. But in fact, all these languages can be translated into one language. Um, and that's the content of the thesis of unity of science, that there's only one science. right? So you can see, by the way, why Carnap uh, presumably preferred his old title, the physical language as universal language of science, to this new title, the unity of science. The old title makes the formal mode explicit. Um, he was probably told that it would not sell in English if he called it that, so he changed the title. Um, okay, um, so as an example, here's an example of the difference between the formal mode and the material mode. Um, This isn't the first example, but I think it's the best example to use. So in the, let me start with the material mode. The material mode says, the simplest statements in the protocol language refer to the given and describe directly given, ex sorry, describe directly given experience or phenomena. That is the simplest states of which knowledge can be had. Right, so the protocol language, um, the protocol language doesn't consist only of these um, primitive protocol statements, but uh, um, the protocol language contains these primitive protocol statements, and pretty quickly he switches to using protocol statements or protocol sentences to mean only the primitive ones. So the simplest, that is the primitive statements in the protocol language, the material mode, we say, they're the ones that are about the given. And ones that are about what is immediately given. Again, that was how he mostly talked about it in the Aufbau. Now the formal mode says, the simplest statements in the protocol language are protocol statements. That is, statements needing no... Uh, the original here. Like some, these are not really, they don't take exactly the same approach. But anyway, the simplest statements in the protocol language are primitive protocol statements. That is, statements needing no justification and serving as foundation for all the remaining sentence, statements of science. So, um, didn't notice there that he seems they don't seem to match up exactly but anyway um, the point 
uh, that's important for our purposes is the difference between the material mode and the formal mode. In the material mode, you say um, certain senses, sentences are about the immediately given, and so if everything else can be reduced to those, then we know that all those other things are about what's actually given to me, what I actually can know. In the formal mode, we say certain sentences are allowed to be written down without justification, so to speak. That's a rule of the language. Right? The language, in the sense of language that Carnap is using here, includes rules about um, what statements you can infer from what other statements. So if you have this statement down, you're allowed to write this one down. Syntactic rules of inference. And as a subset of those, it contains statements. It, 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 it uh, um, describes which statements can be inferred from nothing at all, that is, what, which statements can just be written down without being derived from another one. Um, and so instead of saying certain statements are about the immediately given, now we're just going to say certain statements don't have to be inferred from other statements. Um, So, um, I'm discombobulated by all the technical problems I had, but okay, I'm going to try to settle down. Beavis. All right. Um, so, uh, right. So, this, um, the new clarity is that philosophy is about language. But that's supposed to show um, not that philosophy is a branch of empirical science, but that philosophy is different from empirical science and yet doesn't introduce its own new content. Um, so this, I'm going to read to you from the introduction. So uh, this, I didn't assign this, and this is... Um, the Unity of Science was published with a big introduction by Black, the translator, and then with a shorter introduction by Carnap himself. So he wrote an English introduction for this new um, version. And um, he starts by saying, in the first place, I want to emphasize that we are, that we, so we means the Vienna Circle, right? When I mentioned before, Carnap and his friends, the logical positivists, or the founders of logical positivism in Vienna. So in the first place, I want to emphasize that we are not a philosophical school, and that we put forward no philosophical theses whatsoever. To this, the following objection will be made. You reject all philosophical schools hitherto because you fancy your opinions are quite new, but every school shares this illusion, and you are no exception. Right? So it's true, as I mentioned, I think, before, many uh, schools of philosophy in the past have said, um, well, and you know, philosophy was all bad. Um, traditional philosophy was all bad and uh, unscientific. Um, but now we're going to fix that, and we're going to fix it by um, uh, rejecting all that bad philosophy and just having science, something like that. So he say, so so the objection is saying, yeah, everyone says that, you know, but uh, they all just introduce a new philosophical school, really. So this is Carnap's reply: No, there is this essential difference. Must be the answer. Any new philosophical school who would reject all previous opinions is bound to answer the old, if perhaps better formulated, questions. But we give no answer to philosophical questions and re instead reject all philosophical questions, whether of metaphysics, ethics, or epistemology. This is the switch that I mentioned. This is the point at which he stops saying that ethics may be a branch of empirical science and starts saying ethics is metaphysics. For our concern is with logical analysis, 
If that pursuit is still to be called philosophy, let it be so, but it involves excluding from consideration all the traditional problems of philosophy. Now, I mean, uh, there's two ways of reading this. One would be to say, well, we're rejecting all the traditional problems of philosophy, but there's some new problems of philosophy that we're taking up, the problems of logical analysis. But um, I think... Uh, um, if you understand what he means by it, in the past philosophical schools had to answer the traditional questions, but we're going to reject all these questions. What he means is, so to reject a question, how can you reject a question? Right? Like, you might think you could say, I don't know the answer to the question, or that question's not worth asking, or it would be dangerous to ask that question, we don't want to know the answer. But you couldn't just say, that's not a question. Right? I mean, a question's not true or false, it's just waiting for someone to answer it. So, but what it means to reject a question is to reject the concepts in terms of which the question is phrased, basically. Right? So if someone asks you, to use the example I was talking about last time, if someone asks you, which race is superior? So rather than saying, I don't know, <laughs> or, you know, that requires further research, or um, I don't want to answer that, you say, well, hold on a second. There's no such thing as a superior race. Right? That is, that concept has no purchase. It's not a legitimate concept. And thereby the whole question is rejected. Right? Like any answer to it is going to be wrong because any answer has to work with the concepts that the question included. So when Carnap says that previous schools accepted the old um, philosophical questions and just tried to give better answers to them, but we're rejecting them all. What he means is, well, I already erased it, but he means it's that same thesis that the reason we're better is that we're accepting only legitimate concepts. And what are the legitimate concepts going to be? Well, they're going to be the concepts of empirical science. So all questions, as he already said in the Aufbau, are going to be answerable within empirical science. So there aren't any other questions that are going to be answered by logical analysis. So how can that be? Um, I mean, this logical analysis is supposed to be about languages. Aren't languages empirical things? Um, You know, marks on paper, or on whiteboards, sounds. Um, aren't these all objects of empirical science? So shouldn't philosophy, so understood, be a branch of empirical science? Call it, you know, empirical linguistics. Um, so the answer, according to Carnap at this point, is that... Um, logical analysis says things about the, those empirical objects, but only tautologous things. Right, so a tautology, I mean, strictly speaking, a tautology is a statement of the form A is A. Right? I mean, tautology just means the same word in Greek, right? So it's like, um, strictly speaking, a tautology has the form A is A, but there's an expanded use of tautology um, um, that is, I mean, I don't think it was actually invented by the logical positivists, but they certainly... Um, took it and ran with it, according to which a tautology is any sentence that's true um, 
just by virtue of the form of the sentence, and you don't have to know anything about what the sentence describes to tell whether it's true or not. Right? So um, A is A is an example of that, but so is, you know, A is A or B. Right? At least if A and B are legitimate concepts, um, then uh, you don't have to know which concepts they are to know that A is either A or B is true. Um, so, um, um, how do we, how do we, how does Carnap understand why that is, or what it means to say that you don't have to know what this sentence is about to know whether it's true or false. I mean, the way I just put it was is material mode, basically. Right? I don't have to know anything about the object described in this sentence to know whether the sentence is true or false. But um, the way Carnap will put this in the formal mode is to say, um, um, either uh, this sentence, let's talk about a language in which this sentence is an axiom. So if you have a, a language in which this sentence is an axiom, that means you have a language where you're allowed to write down this sentence. That is, um, Sorry, I guess I should say, suppose you have a language where every sentence of this form is an axiom. So if you have, no matter what A and B are in our language, you're always allowed to write down this sentence without further justification. Um, then, and you go on to derive consequences from that. So a consequence might be um, um, uh, I mean, you have to say more about the language than just that to get any consequences out of it. But the cons the what the more things you're going to say about the language are going to be things like rules of inference, right? If I have a statement of a certain form written down, I'm allowed to write a statement of another form. Um, um, so, you know, a rule of inference might be that if I have A and B already, I'm allowed to write down, um, let's see, I've switched from using variables. It's, Oh, I do. I'm getting myself all mixed up here. I'll just use a different kind of variable here. If I have two sentences, call them phi and psi, the rule of inference tells me I'm allowed to write down phi and psi. So now, suppose I know this. I mean, suppose I our language has this characteristic that everything of this form is an axiom, and it has this form of characteristic that this is a rule of inference. And suppose I have written down C. Well then, I know every language that has these characteristics has the characteristic that I can then write down this. Right now, I mean, so that is anytime I write down anything, I'll be able to write, oh, this and 
any sentence of this form that I want. Right? I mean, that's a trivial example. It's just saying that, um, you know, if you have something that's an axiom, then since it's always true, this is the material mode, since it's always true, it and any true statement is always true. Formal mode, again, says, well, um, if you have a rule that you can always write this down, and you have a rule that um, given two things, you can always infer something from them this way, then if you write down any statement, you're allowed to write down a statement like this. And so is it about the empirical things we call language or isn't it? Well, um, um, it doesn't matter what the empirical characteristics of the language are, right? Like, it doesn't matter what symbol the language uses for or. It doesn't matter um, what types of symbols the language, is, language can admit as values of A or B or C. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's normally what we would call a language at all, right? I mean, it could be that, um, that you know, this pen is a statement in some language <laughs> in this sense, and that writing down this statement and this statement means doing this with them, <laughs> right? Um, the only question is going to, you know, once we fill in what all those things mean empirically, um, we'll know in the case of that weird pen language, we'll know that, you know, if I have a pen that I'm doing this with and another that I'm doing this with, I'm allowed to do this. <laughs> we fill in all the statements differently with more normal values and we'll know that in English, you know, if you say, um, Johnny is going to the market. You're also allowed to say, um, you know, uh, this pen is this pen or a giraffe and Johnny is going to the market. <laughs> so, um, um, so, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have gone into all of that. I kind of wavered about whether I should, and now I'm feeling like maybe I shouldn't have. <laughs> um, because I'm not sure if that was clear enough to be useful, and yet uh, it took a long time. Um, so anyway, what, what I can say is that in this big book that Carnap published around the same time, first of all in German and then later in an English translation, The Logical Syntax of Language, he says things along the lines of what I was saying, but much more carefully. <laughs> and much more carefully than he says in the unity of science either. He's careful about what kind of variables stand for what and whatever. And he tries to make out this thesis that as long as philosophy sticks to the formal mode, um, it has no content of its own. The only content is the content of empirical science. Um, okay. I was going to go into the difference between syntax and semantics, but I see that I don't really have time for that. And maybe it's not important for this course, although it is important. So I'm going to skip it and go on to the second thing that's new in the unity of science, right? So the first thing that's new is this insistence that, strictly speaking, we're talking about languages and we're talking about the formal properties of language, the ones that don't have to do with their content. Um, well, not, sorry, the, the ones that don't have to do not just their content, but with their empirical realization, with what the language actually consists of. Okay, the second thing that's new here is the thesis of physicalism. Now, I didn't assign most of the parts of the paper that are actually arguing for the thesis of phys physicalism. Um, 
most of the parts of the paper that are arguing for the thesis of physicalism are similar to arguments he made in the Aufbau. That is because they're about why we should think that psychology and um, sociology and so forth um, can all be reduced to the physical language, right? He already said that in the Aufbau. The new part, the new thing about this is, well, first of all, that basically he's going to recommend a physical basis, right? So in the Aufbau, remember he said we could, a physical basis might be useful for certain purposes. Here we're going to use this auto-psychological basis. In the unity of science, he's saying um, he's not changing his mind that this is just a choice, a choice of basis. But in the unity of science, he's saying we really should choose a physical basis, not an auto-psychological basis. Why? Well, um, officially at least, the answer is that the physical language is universal in this strong sense. Namely, not only can all the other um, um, languages, the special sciences like psychology and economics and so forth be translated into it, but also everyone's individual auto-psychological, what he called in the Aufbau auto-psychological language, what he's now calling the protocol language, everyone's individual subjective language can be translated into it also. So the physical, um, um, the physical language is universal and intersubjective. Um, there aren't any statements in it that um, belong to one subject and not to another. Um, Well, I guess I'm saying that wrong. The physical language, like all those other scientific languages, is intersubjective, right? That is, it, it refers only to publicly observable things. Um, it doesn't refer to anyone's private experience. That's the material mode. Um, formal mode is something like it doesn't contain any sentences that some pe that that one person is allowed to write down and no one else is allowed to write down. So it's an intersubjective language, and it's uni it's supposedly universal in this very strong sense that even what look like subjective languages can be translated into it. Can be tran can be translated means we're going to accept this translation. We're going to will this translation, <laughs> right? Um, it's a, again, it's a practical matter. Um, so, but that means if we are willing to accept that translation, then it turns out that all those apparently private subjective languages are actually also um, um, everything you say in them is equivalent to something you can say in an intersubjective language. So only the physical language shows all of this, that all the languages of science can be translated into one language, and that everyone's private subjective language can also be translated into that language. Um, and uh, that's why the physical basis is so great. Um, if you take enough, if you tried to have, say, an economic basis, then you would find that all kinds of sentences of physics can't be translated into the economic basis. Um, um, if you tried to have an auto-psychological basis, 
you would find that all the sentences of all those languages can be translated into this basis, but it's not intersubjective. Um, so notice that um, the two things that the constructional system of the Aufbau is supposed to do are still being done together by one system here. Um, but the way the two work together has changed. So the two things that the constructional system is supposed to do um, are show the unity of science and demonstrate the verifiability of the statements of science, thereby allowing us to exclude the unverifiable statements as metaphysics. So, um, so in the Aufbau, uh, both of these things are done by reduction to the basis. Right? Reduction to the autopsychological auto basis takes everything at the higher levels and changes it into a statement at the lowest level. So that, and the lowest level is the level that describes the immediately given. So, um, so it shows unity of science because everything is changed into one um, statements about one object type. And it shows verifiability because that object type is the object type that we're, we're evidently justified in talking about, the one of which we have immediate knowledge. In this system, on the other hand, first of all, we have two different languages. We have the protocol language. So the protocol language is the language that I would supposedly write down in my transcript or protocol of my own experience. Um, so uh, strictly speaking, everyone has their own protocol language, but let's say this is my protocol language. And then we have the system language. Now, the system language corresponds to what we called the constructional system before. I guess maybe even at this stage, he's thinking that there also could be a kind of constructional system in the protocol language. Um, But he doesn't emphasize that. The important thing is that in the system language, everything can be reduced to one basis. The basis now is the physical basis, right? So everything is going to be, all the statements in the system language can be replaced by statements about fundamental physical entities, whatever those are, particles and fields and whatever. That's what establishes the unity of science. Verifiability is going to be established a different way. It's going to be established by showing that um, from all the statements of this physical language, you can infer statements in the protocol language, and in particular, primitive protocol statements. Um, so how is that possible? These are in a different language from this, right? So how can there be a rule that says I can, how can there be any rules that say I can infer from one statement in here, a statement in here? Well, so strictly speaking, there are two steps. There's a translation step and an inference step. So the translation step is that this primitive protocol statement, remember we said it can be translated into a physical statement. And then every other physical statement will be shown to imply some of these translations. Right? So like an example, you know, um, suppose, I guess the physical language doesn't contain statements like this, but suppose the physical language contained a statement like um, an apple is falling from the tree. 
um, uh, at time t, um, and uh, um, strikes the body n at time t1. So then suppose Newton's protocol language contains a statement like, you know, pain here now. <laughs> um, so pain here now, there's going to be some kind of translation rules that allow us to translate that primitive sentence, pain here now, into a physical description of what's happening to Newton's body at a certain time. And then it's going to turn out that that physical statement that said that the apple was falling from the tree and hit body N implies that Newton's body is in that state. Right? So indirectly, by way of this translation, it implies the protocol statement, pain here now. Is that clear? Is there a question about that? Right, as opposed to the old way of doing it in the Aufbau, which would have involved um, translating this whole physical language into, say, Newton's autopsychological auto language. So it would turn out to be a huge statement about the fundamental experiences and the basic relation, which would, you know, um, be equivalent to the uh, to the higher level autological auto psychological statement pain here now <laughs> right so in other words it, um, um, in the old way of doing it uh, anything that had any meaning in the physical language could be completely translated into some statement of the protocol language in the new way of doing it it's just that everything in the physical language has some implications that can be translated into the protocol language. So, um, um, whereas the old thing about complete translation, reducibility, now only takes place within the system language, and we say, yeah, the higher level scientific languages can be eliminated in favor of the physical language. So what goes along with this is therefore A relaxation of verificationism. The physical language can now contain statements which um, um, no number of protocol statements are equivalent to. So, um, if you go back to the example of the apple falling from a tree, you know, there's other things that could also cause pain here now. That is, um, there's other things, I have this picture up here again. So there's a physical state of affairs that's equivalent, we're accepting as a translation for the protocol statement, pain here now. Um, but over here is the physical statement that says the apple is falling out of the tree. Now, this physical statement might imply this one, right? Meaning if an apple falls out of a tree and hits body N, then Newton will feel pain here now. But lots of other things would also imply this physical statement. Right? So someone could fool Newton into, someone could do something to Newton's head that felt exactly like an apple falling on it. And that would cause this exact same physical state of affairs, which would translate to the exact same protocol sentence. 
or in other words, as we would more normally say it, you know, feeling pain here now is evidence that you've been hit in the head with an apple, but, you know, it's defeasible. You could collect more evidence that would eventually show that, no, it wasn't really an apple. It was something else. And you say, well, but I also saw the apple, you know, oh, but that turned out to be a mirror or a hologram or whatever, right? So, um, so this allows Carnap to... Um, accept the ordinary thought that um, our statements about the physical world in general are not completely verifiable. There isn't any finite amount of evidence that would allow us to say for sure whether they're true or false. And I mean, so, I mean, that's the main relaxation. There's also some other ones that involve even within this system, he's going to say that the general laws can't actually be reduced to a finite number of singular statements and so forth. Um, but that's the main retreat from verificationism. Um, from Carnap's point of view, and I, I emphasized the reasons for this last time, and now I'm going to emphasize the reason for it again from the other side this time. From Karnas' point of view, that's not such a big deal. Why? Because as I kept stressing, even in the old system, it was only in principle that you could tell using a finite number of auto-psychological statements whether something was true or false. Right? So what, you know the statement about the realm of the given, Newton's realm of the given, that would be equivalent to, a, you know, an apple fell out of the tree um, um, in the Aufbau would actually be a statement about Newton's entire experience throughout his whole life. Remember the fiction that Carnap had to introduce in the language of fictitious operations, the fiction that all our experience is over and now we're processing it, <laughs> right? So, it, so that big statement would say something like, throughout Newton's whole life, all evidence pointed towards the apple point falling out of the tree and now there won't be any more because it's over, <laughs> right? So, um, um, so, you know, on the one hand, it's less unreasonable than you might, it might at first seem. In fact, raises a question why Carnap feels the need to do this. Um, but it's less unreasonable than it might at first seem to say we should accept that as a translation of the apple fell out of the tree. Right? If all the experience I'm ever going to have in my life points to apple falling out of the tree, then, you know, what else do I mean when I say an apple fell out of the tree? So, you know, Carnap wants to say at this stage, well, what, what do you mean? That's the material mode. What sentences are you willing to accept as translations under what circumstances? And, um, you know, he's going to say at least it's more convenient to set up our system so that, no, even then I'm not going to accept the statement the apple fell out of the tree as a translation. But again, the difference is in this like really uh, abstract char characteristic of the languages we're adopting, the difference is not in what we would actually do or say, right? Because in real life, it's a fiction, right? Newton can't actually check all his experiences throughout his whole life to see if they add up to apple falling out of the tree. He's going to have to go on, he's going to have to decide when to stop accepting new evidence and say, you know what, an apple fell out of the tree. Um, so, um, so either on the old system or on the new system, what we basically have are sentences and rules for what counts as evidence for or against those sentences. And furthermore, but, you know, this is what Carnap's always going to say in a situation like this. And Popper in a situation like this is always going to say, we must guess. <laughs> Let's see. Carnap in a situation like this is always going to say, we must choose. If you say, okay, when do we stop, you know, looking for more evidence? It's a matter of convention. 
think is Carnap's considered answer. We have to, it's again, it comes down to a determination of our will. You know, what is most convenient or ethical or whatever? When is it best to stop looking for more evidence and adopt the statement, an apple fell out of the tree? We're responsible for making that decision. So therefore, I think from Carnap's point of view, and I'm emphasizing this especially because from Quine's point of view, it's going to turn out that everything was given up at this stage. The whole project is worthless after this. But from Carnap's point of view, nothing much has changed. We, you know, the important things, unity of science and verifiability, meaning that science speaks in such a way that I'm responsible for my words, that is, that... I, you know, have agreed to ways that evidence for and against them, can, my statements can be collected, something like that. All of that is still here, and we've just changed the syntactic rules of the language a little bit for convenience. Okay. Um, I'm going to switch from talking to about the unity of science to go on to talk about Neurot. But before I do that, are there questions about the unity of science? <laughs> I'm a little freaked out by seeing all these, all these still images of people like staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, there's one. There's, I'm still seeing one moving video. <laughs> um, anyway, um, okay. Uh, but um, yeah, I know. I turn off my video as whenever I can too, so that I can like eat and read my email. Oh, hi. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, all right. So uh, if there are no questions, I'm going to go on to talking about Neurot. So um, I don't know, Neurot. I used to have a pet, pet rat named Neurot. <laughs> after Otto Neurot, although um, rot is not actually the word for rat in German. In German, the word for rat is rata, but anyway, it sounds like it means new rat, but <laughs> right, so uh, that's not why Neurot is important in this course. <laughs> um, so uh, Neurot was a close associate of Carnap's in Vienna, um, and uh, at the time this exchange happened, uh, Carnap had moved to Prague, but um, they were exchanging arguments in the journal of the Logical Positivists, which was called Erkentness. Um, so they were writing back and forth. Um, in those days, if you founded a new school, you would start a new journal. Um, and people didn't say, well, that's, sorry, that's not one of the top journals. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that's maybe no longer possible. But in any case, um, so uh, um, so on the one hand, it's not surprising that Neurot and Carnap agree about a lot of stuff, right? They agree, number one, that there's um, only one science. Um, Neurot actually was... Um, was the one who started this project called the International Encyclopedia of Unified Science. Um, and so they also agree that philosophy is basically about the language of science and that from now on it should be in the formal mode and not the material mode. Um, they agree that metaphysics is meaningless and should be immediately jettisoned from uh, philosophy doesn't require any more analysis or anything. We should just get rid of it. Um, and they also agree that this stage that they're going through of criticizing traditional metaphysics and 
worrying about whether each of them has gotten the right start in this project is temporary. They're optimistic that it's already ending, and soon we're going to move into that phase that Carnap mentioned in the Aufbau, where we're all going to cooperatively build up um, philosophy piece by piece, brick by brick, um, and there won't be any more of these in principle disputes that can't be settled and so forth. And again, we already know, like spoiler, we already know <laughs> that that didn't happen. <laughs> there was no time when that happened. The, the history of logical positivism was all disputes about these fundamental ma uh, matters, basically, and they never got on to the positive project. But at this point, it still seemed in the early 30s like maybe that was going to happen. So um, they agree about all of that. On the other hand, they disagree about a lot of stuff. I mean, that's one thing that's clear from this exchange. Um, among other things, they disagree about what they disagree about, right? I mean, they, you know, Neurath has one diagnosis about why he disagrees with Carnap, and Carnap comes back with another diagnosis which says, actually, in fact, if you look at it, Neurath and I are just discussing different possible language forms for the universal science. And his could be useful in some ways, and mine could be useful in some ways, right? So they disagree about what they disagree about. Um, they also disagree about a lot of particular points, and it's not clear which comes first. But at least it seems to me that a good clue as to what comes first Well, I'll say what the clue is first, and then I'll say something about the clue. So the clue is the political differences between Carnap and Neurat. Right? Carnap is a socialist, a democratic socialist of some kind. Um, he had to play that down after he moved to America. Um, it wasn't exactly the best thing to emphasize in America, America in the 50s, that you were a democratic socialist. But in any case, yeah, so Carnap was a democratic socialist, but Neurath was a Marxist. Neurath actually, um, um, after the revolution in Russia, went, uh, actually, it was, it was, it was later, it was after Stalin was in power. Neurath went to Russia to advise the Stalinist regime on how they could be, you know, probably tell, told them how they can introduce a great new symbolic language and teach it to the peasants. Uh, I don't think they paid much attention to him. <laughs> but he, from his point of view, he was, you know, identified with um, orthodox, you know, official Marxism. So um, he has some things to worry about that Carnap doesn't. Yeah, one th so one thing to say about that clue is that is it um, either strange or somehow uh, dismissive to take this technical argument between philosophers of science and say, well, uh, what's actually fundamental here is a political disagreement. Um, I think this may have changed now. I think 10 or 20 years ago, if you said that to, to philosophers of science, they would be offended, right? They would say, well, yeah, we have our personal political beliefs. We don't let, get, let that interfere with our philosophical theories. <laughs> this is about, you know, what premises imply what conclusions and what intuitions we have about whatever or something, right? Um, but uh, I think that... Uh, you know, at least if you accept what I said so far about Carnap, you'll see that from Carnap and Neurath's point of view, that's far from the case, right? Like, as far as they're concerned, um, 
the whole reason to be interested in this is because important ethical slash political issues are at stake in choosing a philosophical language and understanding how to be linguistically responsible. Um, and, you know, they both have in mind the fact that Heidegger, um, first of all, is saying the same thing, right? I mean, Heidegger's position also is that traditional philosophy is irresponsible in its use of language and that, and that you know, the way forward is to fix that. And he agrees that it has something to do with politics, but his politics are Nazi politics, <laughs> Right, so um, so that makes it very plausible that this kind of disagreement about um, language is ethically and politically important. Um, so that's the that's one thing to say about this clue. I guess the other thing I don't have time for. I was going to say something about like how this sounds different now than when I first started saying it, because now Marxism is um, like fashionable again. <laughs> um, I, mean, I guess it never went out of fashion in the like social sciences, uh, but uh, it's now broadly fashionable again. Yeah, so, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't even know what to say about that anyway, so I'm going to skip it. All right, so, um, but I mean, you may hear that when I discuss it, like to me, Marxism is kind of exotic. Like, uh, um, it's not like, oh yeah, me and all my friends are Marxists. Although it seems like most of my Facebook friends are these days, but <laughs> whatever. Um, so, uh, but I mean, I think that's probably, you know, you might find that that's still the case if you realize how much Neurath is trying to stick to the Stalinist line. You know, uh, I mean, this, you're not talking the Frankfurt School at Althusser or something like that. It's, it's pretty um, strict, I guess. So, right, so there's a number of things that Neurath is worrying about. One of them is materialism, right? Like I mentioned this before, if you're Marxist, you're supposed to be a materialist. Now, um, you know, materialism is a, strictly speaking, is a metaphysical thesis, right? I mean, it says the only real things are material things, whatever that means exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so, um, on the face of it, it seems hard to see how someone could be anti-metaphysical and materialist. But um, the solution is to um, try to maintain in a very strict way that the only um, the only statements we are allowed to use are statements in some equivalent of what Carnap is calling the physical language. So, like, you might think, and Carnap, I think, does suggest in response to Neurath, well, I, I guess, as I mean, I think, like, Carnap's physicalism is partly uh, an attempt to mend his fences with Neurath, right? And he wants to say, okay, yeah, I agree with you. The physical language, that's the best basis. Um, but um, so you might think that, yeah, that is the same thing as what I just attributed to Neurath, but it's not really because of that business about... Um, um, well, I guess because of two things. One, that Carnap still says, you can choose, of course, to speak a language that's not intersubjective, blah, blah, blah. Um, but also that stuff about logical analysis being about language, but not insofar as language is actually a physical thing. So Neurath is against both of those. He wants to say, 
when we talk about languages, we're talking about sounds and marks on paper. And um, when we talk about a protocol language, the only thing we could mean by that is the kind of marks someone actually could make in their notebook, which are physical things. <laughs> Right? So the protocol language, the way Neurot right away starts understanding it is sentences we could actually get people to use as a transcript of their experiences. Meaning sentences we could actually, so to speak, authorize people to produce. <laughs> um, Right? Who's going to authorize people to produce them? Well, we. Who is we? Well, I mean, I guess we is all res the responsible speakers of language together or something like that. But of course, we know that um, most people aren't on board with this yet. So it's like it's the vanguard of the proletariat, basically. <laughs> I mean, we are going to uh, decide what kind of sentences people should be authorized to produce, how it should be allotted, and whatever. Um, and, um, and therefore, he right away starts discussing these questions that from Carnap's point of view, at least the way Carnap was thinking before, don't make a lot of sense. Like... So what happens if someone writes down two contradictory sentences in their protocol at the same time, right? I mean, Carnap was still really thinking of this protocol as that fictitious product of the subject in the, in the fictitious operations and the Aufbau, right? I mean, it's the kind of things that in principle could be written down in someone's exact transcript of their immediate experience. Of course, there are no such written records and whatever, right? So, I mean, actually, you see at a key point in the unity of science where Carnap discusses the different ways the protocol language might be, when he mentions the, the form that he actually used in the Aufbau, where the protocol statements are about complete experiences at a certain time, so in the material mode, it says, the protocol sentences describe complete erlebnis or experiences at a particular time. And in the formal mode, it says, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Why? Because, uh, like, what could you write there? <laughs> I mean, you, you know, you would have to write something like, um, uh, the protocol sentences have the form of long sentences applying the base, the fundamental relation to basic experiences. And how do we know which those are? Well, you know, the fundamental relation is the one that has these empirical care. Like it would be like this out of control thing, basically, right? Like what could be written on that side? Um, because he's not really thinking of writing that, let alone of someone actually writing those sentences out. And so when you ask what would happen if you wrote two contradictory ones out, well, you know, part of this idealization that Carnap has in mind is that the person is going to be a faithful transcriber of their own experience. So, you know, Um, this sounds a lot like exactly what Marx was trying to get away from, ideology, <laughs> right? That's so, I mean, so, this is, so, so Neurath is zeroing in on that and saying, no, sentences are a physical product of labor. Um, um, and whatever you propose about the protocol language has to be a proposal for how we're actually going to produce sentences. So that goes along with another thing he's also emphasizing, which is
right. philosophers have tried to understand the world. The point, however, is to change it. <laughs> um, um, Carnap is, of course, thinks that this, what he is doing, has some connection with an ethical attitude, which is going to carry forward to the future, and which is going to, you know, um, um, ultimately results in a peace, in a more peaceful and responsible society, or whatever. But um, the connection is a little bit indirect, I guess. It's by way of destroying bad metaphysics and, you know, the kind of connection Kant thought there was between what he was doing in the first critique and ethics. Um, we're going to destroy the bad metaphysics that makes freedom seem impossible, whatever. Um, Neurath turns it around into the language we could we should construct is the language we're actually going to train people to use and um Neurot actually was involved in a project like this <laughs> he had this project he was working i forget what it's called i should have looked this up in wikipedia before i started but he had this project, he was inventing a symbol language that, um, and the symbols stood for things like worker and unit of production and whatever. Um, and the symbol language was, he was, his project was he was going to teach the workers to use this language. <laughs> Uh, and he published a book about it, and he was trying to go to factories and get the workers to start using this language. I don't think it actually got very far. Carnap, on the other hand, by the way, was interested in Esperanto. He was like um, a big believer in Esperanto throughout his life. Um, um, you know, the, so the difference there is, I mean, Carnap did think there was an analogy between what we should do with natural languages and what he was doing. There was some connection, but only some kind of indirect co co connection, right? That is the resolve now to accept a new, improved international language, Esperanto, is like a manifestation of the same Haltung as what I'm doing in logical analysis. Whereas Neurath's symbolic language was the language he actually was going to try to get everyone to speak. And you know, I say he talks about in this paper, he talks about how we, tr we teach children to speak the universal language in a simpler form. And then as they go up, grow up, we train them to use it differently and whatever. Um, So he's very worried about people starting to think about this the wrong way. If people start to think, if people start to get these idealizations in their head, as Norat says, younger men, right? meaning um, but Marxism in this period was, well, Marxism in Marx was fairly sexist. Right? Like one of his main arguments against the factory system is that it forces women to work instead of stay home and take care of the children. Um, right, but so anyway, younger men, Neurath is worried about the younger men are going to be, are going to um, be influenced to, into deviation from the line of logical positivism by these improper ways of thinking. And, you know, then they're going to go out and we're not going to succeed in training them to speak our language, you know, and so forth. Um, he also um, seems to have a further concern about this, which is somehow related to both of these, which is like, um, ownership of the protocol. Right, like Carnap explains that, 
the correct philosophical content of the idea that my experience is private to me and you don't know it by saying that um, um, only I am allowed to write down sentences in my protocol language without um, gathering information about events outside of my body. <laughs> um, so my protocol sentences are mine in that sense. I have a special right to them. I have a property right to them in a, in a broad sense of property right. Um, you can't tell me what I see. Um, uh, that is, you can't, at least, you can't tell me in an immediate sense what I see. You can say what you see is not an apple, it's an apple hologram. But you can't say, it doesn't seem to you that you see an apple. <laughs> it seems to you that you see a banana. Um, so, um, Neurath's response to that is to say that um, it's um, it's not true. Whoever produces a protocol sentence, it's written down. Everyone can use it the same way. Um, everyone has the same problem translating it, so to speak, because um, me, one minute later, I'm in the same position with respect to that protocol sentence as you are. Someone else wrote it down who I'm not now, <laughs> that is me one minute ago. Um, so um, properly speaking, all the protocol sentences are common property. That's one reason the protocol sentence can't have the form pain here now. It has to have a form something like, you know, at T, I'm not gonna try to write it out, but at T, N said to himself, um, you know, um, no, sorry, at T, N wrote in his protocol, at T, N said to himself, pain here now. <laughs> so, right, when it's written out all in that way, um, the, what looked like my privacy just becomes if the fact that a certain word, my, pro my proper name is in the sentence. Anyone can do what they want with it, or, Neurath says, even better, we can make a machine <laughs> and throw them all in. <laughs> and the machine, not being any of us, can sort these protocol sentences according to certain rules and spit out, you know, evidence for and against certain theories. Um, so to all of that, oh, Alfaro, I don't know when you wrote that's a little concerning, but one of the things I said, <laughs> several of them were concerning. <laughs> Um, right, but you know, and so, and by the way, so Neurath says that the the language, and this apparently is true even of the language we're going to start teaching children now, it's not going to include the word I. Because a sentence with the word I, you know, is not usable once it's not attached to the person who produced it. Right, if I just see a sentence like written on a scrap of paper somewhere that says, you know, an apple fell on my head, um, I can't use that as evidence for or against anything because I don't know who wrote it. But if it says at time T, N wrote in his protocol, an apple fell on my head, then all I have to do is look up N in the directory of names and translate it to some physical coordinates <laughs> at time T, and then I know where you know where the apple fell. 
according to this sentence. Um, and that is a little concerning. So, and I mean, finally, there's one more thing, which is actually the most famous thing about this article, but in some sense, it's not that important compared to these other things, I think, which is that Neurath says, oh, and by the way, you know, we don't, um, we don't have the option of making sure that these protocol sentences are all in completely precise scientific language because we don't have a precise universal scientific language Carnap that you're imagining. Again, basically, that's an idealization. We have to use, he calls it the universal slang. He writes the word slang in German. I'm not sure he knows exactly what it means because it doesn't sound right. But anyway, maybe pigeon would be better. I mean, it's a universal kind of hodgepodge, like combination of precise scientific language and other stuff that we don't know how to get rid of, like Uncle Rudy. I guess Uncle Rudy is, is Rudolf Carnap. Uh, right, so, um, um, so Neurat says, you know, we're like sailors who have to rebuild their, their ship at sea, meaning, you know, we're gradually taking out the less precise pieces and trying to replace them with more precise ones. You know, um, I think Carnap accepts that very easily in his response, actually. It's not a big deal from his point of view. Again, it'll be different for Quine. Uh, for Quine, that is going to be a big change. For Carnap, it's not a big deal. Um, um, and moreover, Carnap and Neurath agree on one thing. Neurath says, only metaphysics can be cast overboard immediately. <laughs> Right? So like before we start this work on the ship, there's some crap on the deck, namely metaphysics, and all we have to do is just shovel that off into the ocean and then we can start working on the ship. <laughs> right? So the, the ship metaphor doesn't apply to that part. So um so the ship so so the ship metaphor doesn't uh doesn't mean that Neurot doesn't think there's a criterion of verifiability that we can use to excuse, exclude metaphysics. That we're still working on that. Okay, so I've left myself not much time to talk about Carnap's response. There's a lot of interesting things in this response, including one along the lines of, that's a little concerning, the place where he talks about the utterances of a Negro in an unknown language. That's on page 469. And they underlined that and wrote, why Negro? <laughs> uh, it's a little disturbing, but anyway, I don't know what else to say about it. Just I wanted to point it out uh, <laughs> that maybe I, I was, maybe I gave Carnap too clean a bill of health last time. I'm not sure why that's there. But in any case, be that as it may, uh, that's, you know, from Carnap's point of view, this is part of the issue with confronting the history of racism in philosophy. Am I going to use my remaining three minutes to talk about this? No, I'm not. I'll just say, from Carnap's point of view, that's not the main point of the paper, right? It's uh, if you said, you know, could you change that? I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, um, um, from our point of view, it's like a sore thumb. All right, but in any case, um, how does Carnap reply? So he replies by saying, you know, you and I, Neurot, don't really disagree about anything. It's just a choice of language. And uh, this is the difference. Maybe I'll have time to say more about this at the beginning next time because I really I would like to say a little bit more. I'm, I'm basically out of time, but this is the difference. He says, um, the way I was thinking is that everyone has their protocol language, and the protocol language is a different language from the system language. But the protocol language we accept certain translations of statements in the protocol language into statements in the basis 
of the system language. And then when we collect evidence for things, we find their, which of these translations they imply. And then we say, well, there's evidence because um, this translates a statement in someone's protocol, right? And now what he says is, you know, so this allows us to take people, animals, machines, and Negroes, and um, take whatever sounds they make in response to stimuli, and um, without training them to do anything, use them as evidence for our theoretical statements. Right? So the person says, you know, up, boom, <laughs> and we haven't trained them to say what we would say in the physical language about the apple falling, um, but we have accepted, we have accepted a physical translation of their protocol sentence, up, boom, so now in effect we can use up, boom as evidence that the apple fell. And he says, Neurot, the only difference is with you and me is that um, you're not willing to let this person, or I mean, you at least suggest it would be convenient not to let this person keep saying, ah, boom, but to train them to say what we would say. And once we train them to say what we would say, the, you know, these physical statements actually do imply their statements. Okay, so I'm out of time, so I, I, I will have to talk about it a little bit at the beginning next time. Like, how could this explain all these differences? <laughs> but according to Carnap, that is what explains all the differences as he understands them. It's just Neurot is um, the reason Neurot thinks protocol sentences have to be a different kind of thing than what Carnap thinks they are is just because Neurot is contemplating training everyone to do what we do. And Carnap says, yeah, that would be convenient, and it's sometimes successful with people and animals to train them to do what you want. Which is, you know, I think it's the only point in Carnap's response where you can kind of see that he does get the political level of the disagreement, but he's not gonna go there, I think. But I'll try to say more about that next time. Okay. Thank you. See you on Thursday.